This podcast represents my opinion and the opinion of my guests. This is not medical advice, and I am not establishing a patient-physician relationship with any listener. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each patient is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions you may have. Welcome, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Not Your Doc podcast. Again, we are joined here on Zoom this time uh, by Seth, our producer, Dr. Tadros, of course, Mr. Not Your Doc himself. Hi, everybody. And uh, Dr. Tadros, you've got another special guest for us, so I'm going to kick it over to you to introduce Dr. Joe Flaherty. Hey, Joe. Hi there, Dr. Hey. Well, uh... Joe uh, is a, yet another uh, friend of mine, but that's, once again, doesn't qualify him for anything. Dr. Joe Flaherty is a classmate of mine from St. Louis University School of Medicine. We graduated in 1990, but before that, he uh, went to the University of Dallas, another good Catholic school for undergrad. He came to St. Louis University where we met students together. Then he went to the University of Kansas uh, School of Medicine for his residency in internal medicine, then came back to St. Louis University for his all up in geriatrics. And that's why we have Joe here today. To, Talk about uh, something that I see quite a bit and he sees a lot of, he's kind of focused part of his career on is del- delirium and geriatric patients. Now delirium, uh, we're gonna have to define a bunch of terms, uh, but uh, but Joe actually uh, um, over the years, uh, he's done, uh, he's, he's, he's been a uh, medical director for, for nursing facilities. He's been a hospice uh, medical director. Uh, he's been a researcher. He's been a teacher, teacher of medical students and residents. Um, and he's got a broad experience. Uh, not only that, uh, but but he actually, uh, do you still sit on the board of the American uh, Delirium Society? No, not anymore. I did that yeah. for the first several years. Yeah. So he uh, he's one of the big societies that focuses on delirium. And I bet you a lot of our, 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 our people out uh, in the audience don't know anything about delirium, but it certainly takes up part of my or sure part of my life, uh, whatever, because uh, I take care of you know, hospice patients. And uh, so, first, Joe, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. How's this? How's uh, uh, Joe? Uh, is in Dallas for how many years now? Have you been in Dallas? Uh, going on six now. And Unbelievable. prior to that, you know, I was in St. Louis for about twenty-five years. Yeah, that's, that's when we used to hang out more after after medical school and residency. Joe, uh, you're you're a geriatrician. Can you tell me uh, kind of what's the, what's the difference between what I've heard as gerontologists and uh, geri- geriatricians or geriatrics? Sure, sure. A gerontologist is typically someone who does research or teaches about the aging process. So it might be a PhD person with a PhD. Uh, it might just be a basic scientist who's trying to discover why cells age and why neurons in the brain do what they do. A geriatric physician is a physician who is typically an internal medicine doctor like you, Dr. Tadros. Yeah. And then we do a couple more years of extra training that focuses on that specific older population. Um, and we learn a lot um, how to manage some of the problems that become more common as people get into their 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond. Yeah. Well, how 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 am I going to get into your uh, club? How how old do I have to be to be a geriatric patient? Good question. There is no not as young as me, but I'm not quite as old as Factor Fountain. I'm I'm closer. I'm closer. I'm closer to geriatrics than um, than than uh, yeah, than sweet Vanessa, who's a perfect yes. Perf- yes. perfect young young person. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would give you an analogy that uh, a cardiologist who sees people with heart problems mm-hmm. doesn't see every person that has a heart. Right, right. But and just like a geriatrician doesn't see everybody over the age of sixty-five or seventy, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. we do see people that are in that age group that start to have geriatric problems, such as cognitive impairment, falls, weight loss, frailty. So uh, there are some people who are eighty years old who never need to see a geriatrician, and we mm-hmm. tell them stay away from doctors. That's you're going to live longer, but there's some ah, people. Ah, ah, sure. Sure. Karen, I, of course, you, Joe. I say the same thing. By the way, I tell people, uh, yeah, don't. I'll, all I can do is just do order tests and, and do you in with all the stuff I'm going to do to you. Is, so it's unfortunately true, and I, I hate to say that. That is true. That is true. I'll take a shout out to my parents who I wasn't thinking of doing, but uh, my dad just turned ninety last year, and my mom's turning eighty eight this year. And uh, for better or for worse, I'm their doctor and I see them socially and order their one little blood pressure pill. And I tell them, don't go any, any other doctors. Right. 
unless you call me first. They're, they're already out. They're already the third standard deviation and, and beyond, uh, 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 beyond and on the upside, on the positive side. So yes. yeah, okay. yeah, we could, we could talk about what all this stuff means. And Vanessa, Vanessa, uh, wants, uh, I'm going to throw this to Vanessa. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, I love the analogy of the cardiologist. Not everybody who has a heart needs to see a cardiologist. Not every person of a geriatric age needs to see a geriatrician. Um, so you spoke to some of those, uh, you know, specific conditions that kind of define aging. So um, what what are some of those hallmarks that define aging? Good question. Aging, I would say, is a process part of life. And a lot of things influence that process negatively or positively. We got to keep the positive in mind. Mm -hmm. So genetics influences that aging process your environment, your lifestyle, um, what what happens to you over time with your medical problems, that influences. So a lot of people consider aging as this decline in certain body parts or certain um, functional levels, cognitive issues. But we try to keep in mind in geriatrics, what are the positives about getting older? Mm -hmm. And there are some, there are some. We'd be Hopefully, some people become wiser and, and more experienced. For what kind? We we know more what we want. We enjoy grandchildren, which you can't do at a young age sometimes. So there's a lot of positives uh, of the aging process. So we don't want to just think decline. We want to think of incline as well. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a more specific question about how the body ages. Are all of the organs and systems in my body aging at the same rate? Are there, are there functional declines happening at the same rate or is, can it vary? There are some basic scientists that think every cell in the body is aging roughly the same way. However, from a practical standpoint, your eyes might age faster if we, if we define aging as this part of this decline and weakening of our systems our eyes might get weaker before our ears or vice versa, mm -hmm. or our skin or our heart or liver. Um, and then the brain is one of the big ones. We always want to think, how can we slow that aging process? So it varies, Vanessa, I would say it varies. We have a saying in geriatrics also that the older we all get, the more unique we become because we age, it's so different as opposed to pediatric kids, they, they kind of are all the same. Hitting milestones the same way, right? Yeah, hitting milestones. Perfect. Perfect. You can use. Please feel free to use that one, Joe. Thank you. I can imagine too that the the you know as some a system or an organ starts to work less optimally, the body starts to compensate in different ways, and that can, as you said, it varies what people's abilities start to look like depending on one's aging. Yeah, and so we do try to prevent loss of function or pre try to preserve function, whether it's muscle strength, or cognitive strength. There are many ways out there. We probably won't go into all that, but I would just caution people that there's a lot of voodoo out there that some people might be attracted to, to make it, you know, take this pill to stay to be a hundred. Well, if there's anything that's anti-aging, it's physical activity, it's activity. social interaction, all those things that you hear about. Yeah, a lot of it's not pills, not 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 necessarily doctor driven. It bad, absolutely. I think that's important to differentiate. I think that's important for whenever it comes to aging. A lot of stuff is before you see the doctor. By the time you have to see the doctor because your heart, your kidneys, your stuff, then then things that cows you know, the horse out of the barn. Uh, what kind of problems do you see as a geriatrician that we may not run into whenever whenever you're younger? What kind of stuff seems to be unique? Uh, and you alluded to some of them, but kind of kind of naming some of them. And we're going to focus on delirium here in a second. Yes. And that kind of links back to that other question is, you know, there's the anti-aging, try to stay healthy. As, right. well, when things do start to change, maybe that's when you go to a geriatrician to right. see if it's reversible right. or mitigate, we can mitigate the changes. Right. And those common problems include um, a few big ones would be weight loss. Over the age of seventy, we really do not like weight loss for any reason. Not 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 because of diet, not because of cancer, not because of depression. Yeah, it's a big it's a big marker for bad stuff to come. 
That is correct. That is correct. And when you lose muscle, uh, when you lose weight, you lose a little muscle. And when you lose muscle, you might fall more. Mm-hmm. So falls are another common thing that happen more often as we get older and we want to mm-hmm. try to avoid those. Right. Um, frailty, there's a term frailty. It's, it's mm-hmm. a, technically, it's a lack of reserve uh, a ba- when you're under pressure. Mm-hmm. So if you get pneumonia and you have to go in the hospital and you're frail, you don't have that reserve to bounce back quickly like a person who might be your same age, but they're more robust physically. We, we uh, so just, just to tell people, because I was interested in trauma early on, one of the biggest times to see reserve is young people in trauma in car accidents or falls uh, versus older folk. You know, the older, uh, the older, the 88 year old is pushing a lawnmower and then, 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 the, then they had a car accident, behaved totally differently in the ICU than a 30 year old who was pushing a lawnmower and then is in the ICU because both of them look vibrant, but, uh, but there's a big difference in terms of how their systems behave because of the issue about free. LT and reserve. That's a that's a great point. Uh, Chuck, you mentioned I, I've been down here in Dallas for the past five to six years. I spend ninety five percent of my time in a large trauma level one trauma. Oh yeah, you're a little yeah, yeah, six hundred right. bed. Right. And so the trauma team consults geriatrics. Right. Yeah. Myself and my partner, and we see these folks who have a. It could be a minimal trauma. Finally, doesn't have um, to be. And, you know, breaking a, an arm, but breaking a hip is more serious or a couple of, of ribs. And that's where we start to see that frailty really impact. Yeah. And you, so, you, you're, you're being super nice by you not by not using fancy terms. So the loss of muscle mass is called sarcopenia. Is that age-related sarcopenia? There is some age-related. Uh, there's some iatrogenic means the doctor caused it. <laughs> which we, means- put you, we put you in bed or put you in a cast. That is right. That is right. That is right. We have another saying in geriatrics, bed rest is the enemy, yeah. um, especially in the hospital. Yeah. Um, I used to tease medical students and give them a quiz and say, what's the only reason we order bed rest for older people in the hospital? And they'd come up with 16 different things. <laughs> and I, and we'd pray, you know the answer, Chuck? It's are they older- for the convenience of the medical staff so we know where they are when we round. That's the reason. But the answer is they only order bed rest if someone is dead. It's the only reason, only reason. Get them out of bed. They will prevent all their other problems as as much as possible. So back to your other question, other things we, we address more in the outpatient area would be right. polypharmacy. It's kind of a misnomer, mm-hmm. but it's too many medicines or right. not the right kind of medicines or inappropriate medicines. So if you have a, if you have a loved one that you think are on the wrong medicines or too many, get them to a geriatrician and we start weaning them off little by little. I, I, I tell people as an internist, I, I pile on the medicines and then the geriatricians peel, <laughs> peel away the medicines I piled on. <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. We we probably de-prescribe more than we prescribe. You know, by far. I'm like, these guys, this is not how, you, I'm like, you need you need four drugs for your heart failure. So does the cardiologist says so, but you guys keep peeling them back so they can sit upright and not pass out. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good, a very good example. And then perhaps the, the largest uh, group of people that come to our clinics and then we see in the hospital and i'm going to use the term cognitive impairment Mm -hmm. as a as a broad umbrella term Mm -hmm. and under cognitive impairment you can have people with known dementia diagnosis alzheimer's type vascular type and then you can have a group with acute confusion they've never had any confusion before but they get in the hospital and they have acute confusion and chuck as you know that's called delirium yeah and then there's a group that comes in uh, the hospital sometimes. You don't know if they have a baseline right. cognitive deficit or not, but all those groups have really rough times yeah. surviving the hospital. Yes. Yeah, it's not, it's not, and once again, you're being polite. Surviving, you know, we're talking about morbidity and mortality that are significant. These are, yeah. these are, these are significant. We will, we'll talk a little more about that because I think, uh, how delirium affects even longevity after you leave the hospital for months and sometimes years afterwards is a big deal. It's a marker of bad stuff to come. Exactly. Uh, uh, what, uh, uh, Joe, what is del- del- delirium? I know we're going to talk about several D words, but what's delirium? Uh, probably the medical term, medical definition would be uh, acute confusion mm-hmm. or uh, altered mental status that is caused by either one or more medical problems mm-hmm. or medications. Yeah. Or medications. Right. 
though. When someone has a change in their usual mental status, red flags should go up and we should start looking for medical causes or medications. You and I, you and I have been docs for 30 years and we were medical students before that. They used to call it ICU psychosis, ICU delirium, <laughs> acute confusion. Uh, 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 they used to uh, call it uh, a, a bunch of getting goofy, sundowning. Yeah. Uh, sun, yeah. Now, some of these are lumped in with with the other one of the other D words, but it's you know sundowning. Uh, all uh, we we had we had probably fifteen different terms depending on where you were, uh, and that's uh, that was part of the hardship because people, my, my nurses would would call and say they're they're anxious, and I'm like they're anxious. I mean, are they worried about money? And it's like no, they're just you know they're they're crawling the walls and they're they're anxious. They're picking at things. I'm like that's not. That's not the way you and I become anxious. And so they would term it to the point where we could not talk the same language in terms of what to do. They wanted more stuff to quiet down the anxiety that you would give somebody with a normal brain, but but it was would make things worse. And so mm. just, just using the right term, the correct term is just a big hurdle by itself. Very good point. So the, if you have students, residents, or even attending doctors need to yeah. learn about this, that the term to go search in the literature is yeah. delirium. Yeah, that's right. And believe it or not, I, I work with doctors that still don't know how to spell the term delirium. Yeah. I, but, I, whenever I gave a talk, I, I put the I and instead of where people put the E, I, I agree with you. You have, to have look, you have to be able to spell it and look it up. That's right. The other term that you will see in the hospital is encephalopathy, yep. which has an, its own category and billing purposes. But you can't really do literature search on encephalopathy and come up with, wow, how do I manage this person in the hospital that's now confused or in hospice that's confused? I need to learn some techniques on how to first diagnose this or screen right. for it. And then I need some techniques on how to manage it. And that's why we like the term delirium. And that's what's in the standard. I want to ask a, a follow-up question kind of from the point of view of, you know, a, a non-clinician and if uh, a loved one or someone close to me is experiencing delirium, how might it present? I know you said confusion, but what what are some typical scenarios that you see? Hmm. Okay, so let's say your mother or father are at home. They might be alone or they might even be living in assisted living. Those are the most common or a nursing home, but living somewhere. And they're, maybe their daily function is they can get out of bed by themselves. They get into their wheelchair. They walk with the walker down to meals. They've done their bathing and dressing, and they're doing some basic activities. And then someone would notice they're just either not talking right, okay, or they're not as talkative. Um, or sometimes, like Chuck said, that if they're anxious and they're not usually anxious, or they can't pay attention, um, so any kind of change in their thinking or their term cognition in, in, is a big umbrella too. Mm -hmm. Any kind of mental status changes. And families, I would argue, are the best barometer of a change. Mm -hmm. They know if their mother or father, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. I've had many people come to the hospital and the ER says, oh, they seem okay to me. I mean, they're talking. That's right. And, and, and the, the daughter's like, there is something wrong. It's it wrong. not like this. It is. See, with moms and babies, by the way, Vanessa. Oh, and your baby looks fine. It's like, ah, there's something wrong. Right. Great analogy. People know when there's something wrong. And so then it's the, the doctor's and nurse's job to figure out that at that point. What's wrong? I appreciate that clarification because I think, you know, with a medical definition of, you know, acute confusion, it almost makes me think that the the person who's experiencing it might be able to clock that they are confused about something or well, that they are, you know, something is going on with them, but this is observable from another person looking at their, a change in their cognition. Most often it's somebody from the outside. It's not the person. Once in a while, the person does realize something's wrong, but mm -hmm. it's and that's often with drug induced. If someone takes a new medicine, I just can't think straight. Something's wrong. Right, big deal. But, yeah, uh, because I want to compare and contrast. That's the only way I can hold on to things. That's the way. That's how. I, why I think whenever I'm going to take a test, like I know the stuff, but then they put other things that sm mimic, mm -hmm. and then like, oh, I I didn't realize that something was so close. So the other two D words besides delirium is de depression that I run into and dementia. 
And so those are the three D words that sometimes people have simultaneously. They can have all three. Sometimes uh, we can we we mistake one for the other. Um, and so, can you kind of differentiate, uh, you know, delirium from depression and dementia? Because they all can have a cognitive overlay or primary cognitive issue. You bet. You bet. Uh, one of the keys here is to remember people with dementia. You mean there's already something going on in their brain. There's law. They've lost neurons. The neurons are not connecting. And so that person is very high risk to develop delirium. Delirium, right. And it, do, and it often doesn't take much. It could take no. one, little, one little Benadryl and they'd right. be That's so all it takes. Delirious. A little, little bit of urinary retention, a little bit of constipation. A, right. A little bit of constipation even. It's amazing. Yeah. little yeah. dehydration. Yeah. Just missed a couple meals. That's all. So, so go ahead. Let's go. To, to differentiate. Um, so again, I go back to the family. If a, a family member or a nurse at a facility says right. they're just not right, then even if they have baseline dementia or even a mild cognitive impairment, forgetfulness, if somebody says they're just not right, that is delirium until proven otherwise. Yeah, very good point. Yeah. Now let's say you have someone in the hospital or, or you're a family member and you're trying to figure out um, questions to figure out if this is delirium on top of dementia. So there's three areas that change with delirium that don't really change with dementia. Yeah, everybody just, you know, this is the, the, the purple light, the red light's going on. Take this down. Take this <laughs> down. Uh, the first one's pretty easy. It's the level of alertness. Yes. How alert? Uh, they got their eye, they have their eyes open. Uh, they're looking at you. That's their level of alertness. If they looked a little drowsy or the opposite would be a little hyper alert, you know, they're mm -hmm. just vigilant. Mm -hmm. That's That's number one that's abnormal. Number two is a little trickier, and it has to do with attention, uh -huh. the brain's ability to focus and have attention. If that starts to change, that's more likely to be delirium. Delirium, right. Delirium. And the way I test attention, it's silly, and people laugh, they, oh, I can't do that, but it really works. I have people who are kind of highly cognitive functional I have them do months of the year backwards, December, November, October, and they have to go all the way back to July. Mm -hmm. Or if they've got a little dementia, I'll go, okay, today's Thursday. What was yesterday? Mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday. What's the day before that? And then I just keep going, keep going. If they can go backward, that attention is probably pretty good. Mm -hmm. Notoriously, and, and you'll see this, if they have delirium for some other reason, medical reason, they'll start to go forward. They'll mm -hmm. start to go forward. They'll just get mixed up the Thursday. Thursday, oh, the uh, dog and cat. So they're just all over the place. So that attention and inattention is one of the hallmarks of delirium compared to dementia. So, so the first one I'm going to repeat. The first one is a level of uh, is sensorium. It's uh, their 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 alertness is just, is sensorium. And the second one is attention. Yes. And the third one is even more challenging. It has to do with thinking processes. And we say if. If they have disorganized thinking, mm -hmm. so um, somebody says one word and they start talking about something completely different, like that days of the week, and they start talking about dogs and cats and and pillows and this, and you just can't keep them on track. That's a disorganized thinking. Now that's a little tricky. If as dementia progresses, you will get people with word salad problem and they can't get the words out, or people who've had a stroke. So that third component, disorganized thinking, is a little trickier. A little okay. tricky. Okay. So, so sensorium, so, so sensorium, how alert they are, uh, mm -hmm. their attention, and then uh, and then the third one is disorganized. disorganized thinking, just like I just had. Yeah. yeah. Now you'll notice, at least I and many geriatricians don't use orientation questions to differentiate mm -hmm. between delirium and dementia. Yeah, that's good. But once you enter the hospital, the first thing we're for, yeah, what, what are the, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the, my pet peeve is they ask somebody, who's the president? Right. Okay. And, uh, okay. Okay. and okay, they got it or they didn't get it. But, you know, that doesn't help you because if you have some degree of dementia, you might say Kennedy, that's last president you remember. you remember, right. Okay. So it doesn't help you. And then the other pet peeve I have is people will walk in, the doctors will walk in and say, 
hey, do you remember me from yesterday? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but maybe yes, but does it help you? Because maybe they don't remember, but they're saying yes. And then the other one is the year and the month. Again, people with dementia might not know the year, but people with delirium might not know. Okay. So I tell those are not proof. Good. Students and residents scratch the orientation questions. It may be good it's, to know in an it's, office. It's important for yeah for many mental status and some other things, but not not to differentiate between delirium and dementia. Gotcha. And exactly, exactly. Okay. So if you're taking your parent to a geriatrician or an internist and you want them to screen for dementia, mm -hmm. they are going to ask orientation questions right. and memory recall and clock drawing test. Those are okay. Those are yeah superb. Yeah, so. Uh, for, for for the nurses who are listening, is there, do you use bedside tools to, to assess the delirium and to assess, uh, assess you know, from day to day? Can you assess, uh, can you assess rather than saying they seem better, they seem worse? Is there a way to quantify serially one yes. after another? Yes, absolutely. Um, one tool I use is called the CAM, C-A-M, the Confusion Assessment Method. And it's not as straightforward as uh, people think uh, we, we used to train geriatric fellows that took them, boy, six to eight months to learn this five <laughs> step rule. <laughs> but, it, but it has to do with unlearning what you've already learned and asking yeah. questions. Yeah. It's, it's doing those things I just talked about level of alertness, disorganized thinking, months of the year backwards, things like that. So mm -hmm. that CAM tool is well validated. It can be used as a screening tool in hospitals and in nursing homes. There's one for the ICU called CAM ICU, very well validated. The problem with those, I'm a big proponent. I use it every day because I've been using it for 20 years. Right. And I have a score out of eight. So if someone's five or six out of eight, the next day they're four. Now the next day they're three. Right. I, I feel better. Better, right. But if, no, if, if nurses who do these are not really well trained, it appears zero, zero, zero every day. And I, I get consults in the ICU all the time. And our ICU has been doing the CAM ICU ever since I've been here. Mm -hmm. And I always see negative, negative, negative. And I go in there and the person is delirious as can be. Yeah. They just haven't been trained. Right. Yeah. There's another nurse tool. Oh, go ahead. Good. I was just going to follow up on that. If if it's missed so frequently, what are, what are some key indicators that are just not picked up on? I think it's missed be, until someone is is agitated, not a hand, or until the family says something's wrong. Gotcha. So the most most common delirium case that's missed is we call hypoactive. Right. So they're sleepy, drowsy. They're not causing trouble. They're not causing trouble. They're in bed. They're not eating, not drinking, and they don't get try in trouble for three days, and then they're so dehydrated, their blood pressure drops, and they get call code or something or right. rampant. So that person is almost often missed, and that's actually the worst prognosis is hypoactive. The people who are hyperactive, agitated, they get the attention, right. and they've at least got enough energy. They're climbing out of bed, and if we get them out of bed, they're gonna they're gonna get better. So what would you what you what you once again? I like to corral things because I my brain tends to like to compare and contrast. So there's a hypoactive delirium, there's a hyperactive delirium, and there's a mixed delirium. Absolutely. Can you, talk, can you talk about the mix? Because by the time the doc comes, sees them, it's different than what it was in the beginning and in the morning. You know, so. Great point. And Chuck, I forgot to mention one of the other hallmarks of delirium, different than dementia, is fluctuation. Right. And that fluctuation can happen within hours or that same day. And so you're right. The uh, nurse sees them in the morning. They're calm and cooperative. Right. And, and the doctor comes at one o'clock after lunch and the person's pulling everything out and he says, why didn't anybody call me? This right. person's very delirious. It's, it's obvious, yeah. It's like whenever you do rounds and the uh, the intern and the med students don't see it, but the attendant comes in and the attendant says, you didn't catch it. Like, I asked and they didn't tell me. And now it's, all, it's, always, yeah. it's always different information for different people at different times, yeah. Chuck, I'll add one more thing. I didn't learn this until probably just five years ago from oh. the American Delirium Society. And this data is coming out of mostly the European Delirium Association, the EDA, they right. they were a couple of years ahead of us. They, they, I wonder why. <laughs> we're, we're, so well, rigid, we're so rigid sometimes the way we have to do things anyway, yeah. yes. But they got to jump on um, some of their data. And what one of the things they found is um, the hypoactive folks, they, they come in, they have a urinary tract infection, right. or ammonia, or dehydration. 
Right. They start they start to get better. And as they get better, if they already had a known cognitive impairment like dementia, yep. they're going to go through this phase where they become more alert. And when they become more alert, they want to climb out of bed. And then people call them agitated. And people think, oh my gosh, it's new delirium. Yeah. And they run them down to CAT scans and MRIs and everything. And they dra- add on drugs. But what's happening is they're in the recovery phase. They've gone from hypoactive now to uh, to a little uh, alert, and now they're alert, and their attention is good, and they're they're talking to people. But because they are so used to getting out of bed and walking around, they're in this environment that doesn't let them, and then they get claim, uh, blamed on and agitated and mm-hmm. get labeled another delirium. Mm-hmm. But it's just the recovery phase, just the recovery. So it's kind of like a, 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 a hyperactive piece before they calm down and settle down again. Yes, yes. I often tell families the recovery phase is a little bit more like a roller coaster than an uphill, you know, straight uphill battle. So you'll have some good days, some bad days. Um, but but it, the, the more the more rambunctious I think a patient is in the hospital, the more I think they're going to do okay. I like that. I think right. that it can help them. Whenever whenever somebody is, let's pretend a UTI, the, the, the two biggest infections are urinary tract infections and pneumonias, I assume. Those are the biggest ones in nursing homes and, and hospitals for for. They're not coming in for decubitus ulcers or skin stuff. Uh, how if somebody if we correct the 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 the, the bacteremia the septicemia we correct uh, the UTI uh, how when do we expect their sensorium? I know everybody's different, but do you tell them you know it should be better in seventy two hours two okay. days? What what do you say? Wow, that that's such a great question because this is what families are asking every right, of day. Course. See, yeah. so there's two ways to think about that. If, if part of that depends on the baseline cognitive uh, function. Yes. Right. Well, if someone has moderate to severe dementia right. and they get a simple urinary tract dehydration pneumonia, it's going to take them probably twice as long to recover from that delirium than someone without the moderate to severe dementia. Dementia. Okay. So I usually give a twice as long general ballpark. The other component that delays recovery is um, the longer the delirium goes on. Okay. So it's, it's been going on three days and they're starting to turn the corner. Then yeah, they're going to recover in six to nine days. So you, you what? two to three times as long as the delirious uh, spell? In general, in general. So yeah. the bad news is I saw a lady this morning at a different hospital right. and her delirium started back in the, like early January with a COVID the hospitalization. Wow. Okay. She remained delirious for seven days, went home for two days. While the daughter couldn't take care of her, went back in for pneumonia for nine more days, stayed delirious. So she's been delirious for almost two months now with just little blips of improvement. So I had to tell the daughter, I think it's going to take two to three more months of really getting out of the hospital. See what her uh, new baseline is. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, difficult. All right, so Dr. Flaherty, we kind of covered how you differentiate delirium between, you know, differentiate between dementia and depression and delirium, uh, you know, what it looks like in her patient. So my follow-up question for that, you mentioned that there's, you know, recovery is possible. So what exactly are we treating when it comes to delirium? Is it the underlying medical condition that has caused symptoms of delirium? Or are we managing the symptoms of delirium, hoping that it improves all the time? The answer would be first treat those underlying medical issues or stop the medicine that you think has caused it or watch mm-hmm. out or withdrawal from mm-hmm. some medicines. You might have to restart a little something. So that's one of the causes, but definitely the best treatment for delirium, find and treat the underlying causes, plural. I think the, I, yeah. I think it's very important what, what you hit on and I've been fooled before. Yes. Medications, iatrogenic, is probably one of the biggest up there with infections for delirium. It's probably one of the biggest issues. And and benzodiazepines, because I do hospice, narcotics and benzodiazepines are some of the biggest uh, biggest culprits. Uh, some very old fashioned anti psychotics, antidepressants sometimes, but uh, that's a big deal. But not only uh, have I been fooled by by stuff that we that we put on board that, that causes problems, but when I didn't realize that the patient stopped something, alcohol. And other things that we have withdrawals that I did not realize was happening. We go long hunting for medications and infection, but what they, what, what they were doing is coming off of something uh, that I didn't realize uh, was a big deal. 
Yes. I will I will say that working with doctors down here for five or six years now, good hospitalists, the work up for delirium when someone comes to the hospital after a family member says something's wrong, the workup is so standard. People, they get the, the huge workup. The hard part though is not to hurt not to hurt them during the workup, not making it worse. And then once you find the cause, like the pneumonia or something, how to manage the behaviors so people don't hurt themselves during, or we don't harm them. So that's what I could talk about now, which is very tricky, the management right. of yes. the behaviors. Okay. Yeah, please, yeah, if you're, let's flow into that. Okay, um, let me mention one more cause that I commonly miss about once a month, but I have to remind myself, Urinary retention, I think mm -hmm. Chuck alluded to it, mm -hmm. he didn't cause an acute confusion, urinary retention um, causing agitation, even muteness. People can't tell you they have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. So I, I try to, we all teach these nurses that first thing you think of when someone's climbing out of bed is they probably have to go to the bathroom. It's that simple. And then if they can't empty, we have to empty the bladder for them and usually they call right down. So mm -hmm. urinary retention, if you're a nurse out there, Always think of that. And this is not just men. Men, men is easy part of the prostate. Women who have a fallen bladder, a prolapse, uh, will have a change in the angle of the urethra, and they can also obstruct it also and stuff like that. So that's the Yeah, well, post-hip fracture. I just saw a lady yesterday, confused as can be, 1,200 cc's in her bladder. You and I, you and I are you and I are crying at 450 cc's. Uh, <laughs> that, that's that's people people sense normal bladder sense about 150 cc's. You got to go the 350 cc's most of us go at 450 cc's where we're crying. And this person had 1200 cc's. Yeah. And uh, so it's a uh, it's a screaming problem. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. a not so problem. Yeah. So let's say somebody is um, has delirium. You've brought them in, it's day two, and they're either pulling on things or climbing out of bed or not getting out of bed. We 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 have two methods. One method is the TADA method, which I'll get to, T-A-D-A. -A. But the other method tool we have is something called a delirium unit. Mm -hmm. And it was first developed at St. Louis University back, I think, in 97. And a delirium unit sounds a little crazy, but it seems to work. What we do is instead of put confused patients in a room by themselves, nobody's watching them, mm -hmm. or instead of tying them down to the bed to make sure they don't hurt themselves. Old-fashioned technique, people. Very old fashioned. And then drugs. Now the drugs are hot. Yeah, we have, we have, we have or should out of IV something. Medication restraints. Yeah. We put a we cohort this group at St. Louis University. It was a four bed unit. Mm -hmm. When I moved down here, we opened a five bed unit. Mm -hmm. And the the structure of it is so that a nurse and usually one nurse aide or two nurse aides mm -hmm. are with those five people out in a patient area that they can see them. We all- Semi-circular, a semi-circular It is, exactly, exactly, it's semi-circular. They still have their own room with a door and, a, and windows, but we, we can see them when they're in there. We don't let them stay in there by themselves too much, we get them up. We're also doing something different than the floor, we're getting them out of bed constantly, constantly. Mm -hmm. Up in a chair for three meals a day. Whereas if you walk through a hospital, I will, I will test anybody, 11.30, 12 o'clock p.m., lunchtime, eight out of 10 people will be in that bed right. at lunchtime. And these days are young and old. So we don't do very good at getting people out of bed. But um, so that's one of the things that's been shown in the ICUs is mobility improves the delirium recovery mm -hmm. uh, by, by about half, according to one study. Dramatic. They, yeah, it's dramatic. It's very hard because this is what the people, like you said, people, in the old days we used to strap people into bed, pose them into bed. Yeah. It was because they were crawling, they were causing trouble. We had one nurse to one nurse to fifteen patients on regular floor, all sorts of stuff, or ten patients on regular floor. So it's yeah. So it's, this is labor intensive. You got to get them up and down and stuff like that. But it's yeah. shortens like it shortens like the stays. Yep, this delirium unit shortens like the stays by a little bit. We think there may be some mortality improvement. Even you know. published that last year and way back in in early two thousands at St. Louis University. We did the study down here over a three year period, mm -hmm. and it looked like. Among cognitively impaired people, this is people with dementia, delirium, or implied, we kind of we decreased uh, uh, mortality from a little over eight percent down to about four point five percent. So about a yeah, I mean that's that's a big that's a big percent drop. Uh, now, uh, it, 
Go ahead, please, please. No, no, no. I was going to, I was going to jump into the Tada method because if if you, if people are interested, you published, you were lead author in a 2022 paper that 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 uh, talked about some of this and also showed a diagram of the uh, type of unit, the type of unit we're going to, uh, yeah. Yes, you're right. That's right. It's in there, and there's some references in there to this Tada method and ah, to the del- unit. Perfect. I want you would love some, Dave. We'd love people to replicate it. It's it's. It seems simple, but we've learned the biggest effort is um, training of the nurses. Yes. And if you just throw nurses in a pool with five delirious patients without tools, that they won't be able to do it. So. Well, they they despise the patients eventually because they're sucking. You know, they're sucking all through your time, and there's uh, the and their family members if they're sitting next to them are are, are on the buzzer saying, you know, come help. And, yes. 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 So what we train them on is this method, uh, T-A-D-A, T stands for tolerate, A stands for anticipate, and D-A is don't agitate. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tolerate means when people are starting to climb out of bed, you do tolerate that, but you're going to go there and oftentimes one of the tricks we use is we don't stand in front of them and say, okay, can I help you? Can I help you? No, we, Mm -hmm. we stand to the side out of view, Mm -hmm. but we're there for safety. So the old, old guys trying to get out of bed, he, He's struggling, struggling. He gets one leg over bed, out of the bed, and then he struck, gets the second one. He's pulling himself up, and after about 20 minutes, the guy he is so tired that he lays back down and sleeps for a couple hours. Mm-hmm. And then the, nurse, the nurses have have helped him relax. Right. The opposite is if you don't tolerate that, you tell him stay in bed, stay in bed. That's going to escalate, and he's going to get all upset. Yes. Um, we have tricks of when people are pulling on things. Sometimes we use a fake IV in one arm and keep the good one in the other one. But it's not in, it's just kind of outside, and they play with that. Mm-hmm. We get rid of stuff like telemetry if we really don't need it. Mm-hmm. We don't use Foley catheters unless it's really a mer- problem. Mm-hmm. Mer- the anticipate is, what do we know people are going to do at night? Mm-hmm. Everybody gets up to go to the bathroom once you get to a certain age. And so to think someone's going to stay in bed, it's, it's preposterous. Right. So anticipating they're going to need to go to the bathroom. And more than just in the cup. You know, I, I'm going to challenge Chuck when I get back to St. Louis. Well, we'll both try to... Pee in one of those urinals, lying in. It splashes. It and splashes at it's the best, the best, best of intentions. It splashes all over the place. Yeah. Right. You, right. Right. It just takes forever. It's just hard. It's just right. Mental. It is very. It's it's demeaning. It's demeaning also. Yeah. And then people all oh, just pee in the bed. No, I don't want to pee in the bed. So. Right. No. Right. And then the DA is a big one. Don't agitate, which means we are trained, our nurses and doctors. This is still being done to reorient confused right. people. Don't argue with confused no. people. You're in the hospital. No, I'm not. I'm in my house. Get out of my room. No, you're in the hospital. It just escalates. Right. So we teach nurses just go into their reality. Their reality is their perception. Mm-hmm. Jump into them. And you're, you're in your oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to come in your room. Can I sit over here? Oh, well, sure. Sure. Do you want some ice cream? Sure. So there's some distraction techniques. Mm-hmm. Usually we can calm people down by not agitating them with our usual care. Uh-huh. In my in my clinical notes, I I'll commonly put these behaviors are because people can't cope with usual care. Uh-huh. They can't figure it out, so we have uh-huh. to change our mo, not that. It, it is important to for family members, which is something because grandma always was like this, and they always did like this. They can't believe that she's different, um, and she uh-huh. and, and so that's part of it is that they want her to eat, they want her to do this, they want her for self hygiene, all that stuff. That is important. That they and the answer is. Things are different, and if you force them back into that old routine, you're going to spend all day and night, and you're going to exhaust yourself, and you're going to be angry at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a certain amount of yeah, don't agitate and to tolerate. <laughs> uh, and I tell people exactly what you let's bring the bed to the ground, let's put a pad, and if they want to hang halfway out on the bed, as long as they're not cutting off blood supply to their foot, yeah. to their, you know, let them hang off the uh, edge as long as they're not going to hurt themselves. And uh, you know, and then put them back gently whenever. And I learned this from you. I'm repeating it to I'm re- repeating it to the boss, uh, but I'm saying it out loud to everybody else. And this is different. It's different. We think that people close to the floor is embarrassing and shameful. And the answer is it's a safety. It's a safety technique. We know. Yeah, it's a safety it's, technique that we don't have. Exactly to. right. Culture change is not easy, but it really pays off. Really yeah. pays off. I'm I'm hearing so much kind of common sense compassion and you know, humanizing techniques like you're talking about here that just, that seem kind of the no brainers. Like why, why isn't this happening? Mm-hmm. Um, in more places. And it's making me think of, um, 
my very best friend who's, you know, mother passed uh, last year of early onset Alzheimer's in her early 60s. And um, it was a very quick decline for her. Um, I think there were lots of, you know, polypharmacy issues. Um, but also she just found herself in places where, uh, you know, they didn't tolerate her behaviors. Mm. Uh, so she was inpatient in behavioral units for a while, uh, you know, it, the infection, she had E. coli, all of these things going on at once. Um, and I I don't think she was ever in an environment where she was kind of accepted for herself and allowed to find comfort. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that pretty much every care person that she interacted with was trying to use, you know, drugs or, in, you know, immediate restraints to try and, you know, with that immediate thing, you know, and I'm wondering what does it take to get the type of coordinated care that you're talking about where we can have oversight of the types of medications that she's on and try and get to the root causes of some of these things. Um, but then also what does it take in some of these, you know, assisted living facilities or places where he'd have a lot of memory care, delirious patients, um, to get this more like human level care, which doesn't seem like it would take a ton of resources. Great question, Vanessa. I think our healthcare system for this, if I could put this group of people in a category of you know, any type of cognitive impairment and, and they struggle with usual care, whether it's assisted living and they got the routine or nursing home or a hospital, um, we have to find a new paradigm that fits them rather than having them fit our right. facility. It's, we're, we're really trying to put a square peg in a round hole by having your friend's mother fit into a facility and and obey the rules and mm -hmm. follow the rules. She needs, and I, I don't, I, I carefully use this analogy of, or this example of if we had people on a, a desert island without risk of going into the ocean, but they could walk around on the sand and just mm -hmm. do what one and have food around and they could grab it. Just let them be free. Mm -hmm. The best memory care units I've ever seen is where people are just free to do whatever they want. But mm -hmm. our system is still not set up. The wall, the floors are too hard. Right. Everything. There's uh, too many people. Um, so our, <clears throat> yeah. what's the prevailing interest that, uh, you know, that generated our, our system to be this way. Are we trying to manage cost? Are we trying to yeah. minimize legal liability? Like why didn't we set it up differently in the first place? We're housing a lot of people into, you know, it's military style school, military, uh, uh, where you put it within fall walls and you have to be an efficiency model. Right. Uh, That's exactly so. right. Yeah. Th so there is one little, a few bright hopes here that there are small group homes now mm -hmm. that have three people who live there or mm -hmm. four or five. And so people feel like they're in a home and they yeah. can't look freedom. And those tend to work better than, like Chuck said, putting them in a facility that's barrack right. style. Right. It's That's an efficiency thing. It costs less to put a bunch of people in one spot. Mm -hmm. The other part of this is historically how hospitals developed. I think way back, it was just a place to go to die mm -hmm. where no one to then, and then it developed into places where we started treating people. And now I think it's come become a place where we do high tech mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. stuff. And, but we haven't developed a hospital for low tech. Right. And so the older person that needs that low tech, high touch gets stuck in the high tech I think a good example of a stroke page. You come in, if you think you have a stroke, you go to a stroke center. Right. Oh my gosh, three days later, you won't know who you are because they've done this test and that MRI and ultrasound and bubble studies. And you just get everything and you're like, well, no stroke. Good. Well, three days, you haven't been out of bed. So I think a new paradigm would be something like a geriatric hospital for frail, cognitively impaired folks mm -hmm. that, that still need high intensity nursing. They still need IV. They still need testing like a CAT scan of the brain. But then we do what we do in the delivery. You get them out of bed, you walk them around. So in three days, they don't lose all their function. Mm -hmm. yeah. They maintain it. And then we get them back to where they came from. Mm -hmm. 
the, with their physical function. And you're a big proponent of this. You've, you've talked about this for de- several decades uh, uh, and uh, that you're a big proponent of the, of the geriatric hospital and this philosophy, not just a wing and not just trying to insert the geriatric patient on a on the ortho floor after hip fracture uh, mm-hmm. and try to train the people there because the rest of the culture of the floor is not in keeping, uh, but, but actually a whole physical place. Yes, yes. And it wouldn't have to be large. Right. For example, for a 300 bed hospital, mm-hmm. uh, probably 200 of those 300 people are under the age of 70 and 100 are over the age. Mm-hmm. But of those 100 people over the age of 70, maybe only 30 have a cognitive impairment or frailty. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at about a 10% mm-hmm. group of mm-hmm. the hospital. Mm-hmm. So you'd have a 20, 30 bed hospital next to the main hospital. Mm-hmm. So you keep it separate so you can keep separate cultures, mm-hmm. but you could still get people from the ER, have a little separate ER in your little geriatric hospital. Mm-hmm. And then you have these open units. You have you know a five bed open here and a five bed open here. So it's a circle. Mm-hmm. And that, that the backbone would be giving nurses who are the hardest people, the hardest laborers mm-hmm. we have, and we wear them out. Yep. By making them run up and down a straight hallway, sitting in five, six different patients in five different rooms. Nurses, you know, are very caring. They want to spend time. Right. They spend less than 30 minutes with the patient because of everything else. Right. Our nurses in delirium unit, they lo- they didn't like it at first when they were assigned there. <laughs> they thought, oh, no, we're not doing that. Um, but they love it because they can, they're spending, of their 12-hour shift, they're spending eight of that directly with the patient, yeah. sitting there yeah. talking to them. That's beautiful. Um, I'm going to jump from from uh, from this important this important topics to. I want to talk about something which I didn't recognize until I gave a delirium talk many years ago. Uh, the consequences of delirium in the hospital and 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 after the hospital, months to potentially years afterwards. Yes, great topic, and uh, probably the best data comes from uh, Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. And I give this website to families often. It's called icudelirium.org. Mm-hmm. And one of their biggest research studies was they followed not just older, but younger, 50s, 60s, into 70s and 80s with ICU delirium. And then they followed them up three months later and then 12 months later, and they did batteries of tests. And they found that the younger group with ICU delirium, they gained about 90% of their cognitive function back at a year. I mean, the older yeah, folks had a year, at a year. So they still had some deficits. Mm-hmm. The older you were, the more likely you got about 80% back or 70% back. So what we used to think, Chuck and I were trained, get them out of the ICU, get them out of the hospital, they'll, their brain will come back. Well, That's right. delirium, time is money, time is brain. And, mm-hmm. and the longer you're in delirium, the more severe there is. I think there's some permanent brain damage yeah. that we can't measure. But um, So you will have patients... A year later, wow, I'm just not thinking as good. I'm just can't. I'm just not as good. That's a consequence of that delirium. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, the um, um, uh, we want to always end up on a on a. We're coming up on an hour here. We always want to end up on a on a positive note. For very cool stuff happening all around the world with with robotics and artificial intelligence and uh, and machine learning and uh, one of the things that my brothers are engineers and in, uh, out in Silicon Valley I, I remind everybody we need we need um, and I think uh, your your mentor uh, was was somewhat big on this uh, uh, that about about how we can automate some of this high touch uh, high touch uh, uh, patient care in in homes and and away from the big fancy hospitals and stuff like that. So what's what's in, what's in our what's on our frontier? What's in our future for all of us since you and I are going to eventually be with this group in another 30 years? <laughs> Great. So hopefully a combination of my touch <laughs> and high and high tech. Yeah. Uh like my mentor Dr. Morley, I'm a big proponent of companion robots. Yep. And it sounds silly, but nope. um they you know they understand you. They will. They will listen to you. They'll. They'll listen to your stories over and over, Chuck. Mm-hmm. If you tell the same story over and over. I. I do now. I am. Now. I, <laughs> now I am. Yeah. Now I'm, uh, my wife reminds me who is a thousand times better memory than I do. Reminds me that I've told these stories many times. Before. And the the other hope of technology is that it uh, frees up nurses yes. or staff to spend time with people. Right. And a good example is the darn electronic medical record. Mm-hmm where people sitting in front of the computer documenting so much right. that I think the technology needs to make a few more steps up so that we're just talking about what we're doing. Amen. All that's in the record. 
And I could do that while I'm sitting talking to Mr. Jones or Mrs. Right. Smith and enjoying playing chat, whatever we do. And um, that that's the wave of the future where it's high touch and, and nurses and staff love to be with people. Mm -hmm. And then all the other stuff gets done because of our high tech. Right. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a barrier. It's a, an assistant. We don't have to learn the technologies there. And it's kind of kind of in the background, do, helping us do work. I move, think patient, get... move patients so we don't have so much low back injuries and other issues whenever nursing staff has to have to help mobilize patients. Well, super. Uh, Vanessa, do you have anything else for us? Because uh, I'll ask Joe finally and Seth, because Seth has been watching over us. Yeah, um, I actually did have one last oh. question. Um, I know that you were saying that, uh, you know, in the trauma center, that you work at, that you, you know, you consult on cases all, all the time. I think that as, uh, you know, geriatrics, geriatrics becomes a more established specialty that uh, kind of younger up and coming doctors are paying more attention to the wisdom that you bring to those patients. You think that there's a hopeful future for maybe prescribing less medications to avoid delirium, things like that. Mm -hmm. There is hope. There is hope, but it's not the sexiest specialty. So very, very few people end up going into geriatrics, but if they do, they usually love it. And Chuck is, in, he's an honorary geriatrician. I'm not, not, sorry. Um, they, your patients grow old as you grow old. That's, that's how I became, that's how I became yeah. honorary because I've, I've grown old and my patients have grown old. But things are far better than they were. Uh, 20, 30 years ago. In fact, the, the trauma example is now trauma centers around the country have to if they're a trauma center it's called mm -hmm. g60 in their in their credentials mm -hmm. they have to have some degree of geriatricians or nurse practitioners that can affect their protocol mm -hmm. so that has just changed this year i uh, tried last year last last spring that's a big deal i had not heard about that that's very cool yeah that's right yeah so things are changing and improving yeah continue well, super. I always have tons more questions. I, it doesn't matter. I, I, even though I've known Joe for 30 years, I've, I, I always have, it's as if I've, I'm starting from ground zero. I always have, it's always interesting. Joe uh, 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 replicates uh, our teachers. Uh, Joe is uh, kind of uh, carries the spirits of the people who taught, uh, trained us. Uh, he's, he's a good old fashioned doc and uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's just a plain old good person. Uh, so thank you, Joe, for your time. So are you, so are you, Chuck. Love them. Love them. Nice you. Thank you. And Vanessa, you great. Yeah. yeah, lots of fun. Talk to you soon. I appreciate it, Joe. We'll get you back again. Thank you, Seth. Too. All right. Thanks, Vanessa. You all Thanks, so Seth. For joining us for this episode of the Not Your Doc podcast, we thank Dr. Joe Slayer and Nate Denton for his presence. And I thought us. Um, again, if you have comments or feedback, you can shoot us an email at notyourdocpod at gmail.com. You can also check us out on our website at notyourdoc.com, where you can check out Dr. Chatters' blog, as well as all episodes of the podcast. Uh, we're going to be back with some more expert interviews from Dr. Tadros. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Dr. Tadros. Thank Don't you. Worry. We'll be back right. next. See you. This previous podcast represents my opinions and the opinions of my guests. This is not medical advice, and I'm not establishing a physician-patient relationship with any listener. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only, and because each patient is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions that you may have.